Life is about constant evolution. Always better today than we were yesterday. Welcome to another episode of The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday. I'm your host, Scott Williams, and with me today we have Andrew Dow, who is our SOAS program expert. SOAS stands for... SEAL Officer Assessment and Selection. That's right. So this is a critical step for anyone who aspires to be a SEAL officer. Now, this isn't an enlisted program. This is an officer program. Uh, First, they've got to go through SOAS before they are selected to go to BUDS for the no kidding pathway training. So this is kind of a a challenging selection gateway, if you will, for all aspiring. A required prerequisite. Yes. Um, So the big update we have today for SOAS, um, there have been some changes to the program in terms of format. Uh, So we want to talk about that today. Um, and so Andrew, let's set the table here a little bit and remind everybody, what is the purpose of SOAS? What does this do for us? Thanks, Scott. So just in generalities, the purpose of SOAS is we, we try to provide an opportunity for competitive aspiring SEAL officer candidates to be assessed against their peers, whether it's, um, peers from the Naval Academy, from NROTC, OCS, lateral transfers. They're all competing against each other. And we do this in our controlled environment. It's it's held here at NAB Coronado, the same location um, that other training's being done here. Like BUDS. Right, like BUDS. Mm -hmm. Um, And the program we try to follow, and these aren't changes yet, but this is just a good overview of it. You know, we try to follow these whole, this holistic evaluation methodology, um, and it's all designed to present the SEAL officer selection panel at the end of SOAS with data points so they can make a, uh, a, a clear and final decision on who will receive orders and be invited to go to BUDS SEAL training. Right. And... As in terms of eligibility, do we have any changes to eligibility? So for eligibility for SOAS, um, a couple few a few changes. Um, in the past, you could only apply. I mean, you can apply as many times as you would like, but we would only allow SOAS applicants to attend SOAS twice. And if 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 they applied a third time and was selected to invited to come to SOAS, it would be that would require a waiver from a senior officer. Um, in Naval Special Warfare to allow them to attend. Now, what we've turned to is the only requirement, really, you can apply as many times as you want. You can attend SOAS if you're invited as many times. Mm -hmm. The only real hard stop is the age. Um, To clear the air with this is, you know, the enlisted side, 28 years or younger, no big deal. If as soon as you hit over 28, you would need a waiver from the enlisted side. Right. Officers a little different. The only doctrine that's out there states that you must be commissioned by your 42nd birthday. So to answer your question, how old can I be to attend? Usually it's, I would say 40 tops because of the process, how long it takes. And by say, if you're an OCS candidate, which it would most likely be, um, they would attend, they would apply at 40 and then it's a year and a half before they even get to, to OCS. Right. OCS is 12 weeks. So if you do the math, it's about 42. So that hard stop would be 40 years old, even though it says 42 commissioned, but you have all that prerequisite stuff you have to do to get to. So as do so as, um, and, 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 and think about that for a minute. First of all, you're going to have to be a super man at 40 years old to make it through this training. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who think they can do that. But from our side, we also have to consider we're commissioning a 40 year old officer and we have to think, is this guy still going to be deployable when he's 60? Right. Because we're supposed to consider everyone to do a full 20 years, uh, of service potentially. So are we potentially going to send by the time the guy gets through training, he's what now? 43, 4? Now yes. we're sending that guy out on a first pump. And he he or she is older than the commanding officer, probably, at this point, of a yeah. SEAL team who's got 18, 19 years in. Yeah. I mean, it's a highly unlikely scenario. But technically, the Navy says 
you must be commissioned sometime before your 42nd birthday. That's the rule. Yep. So you're welcome to apply as long as you meet that criteria and we'll see where that goes. And a lot of questions I get is what is the, the, the people who select, who invite the candidates to SOAS, that's the SEAL Officer Community Manager Shop with the assistance of NSWAC, Naval Special Warfare Assessment Command. They decide who attends SOAS. Mm -hmm. um, some of the big things to highlight, GPA is important. Um, I mean, I've seen GPAs as high, I mean, over 4.0, which, which is very impressive, and as low as 2.5. Um, there has been, and, and, and you can see the mix of the GPA being the lower their GPA, sometimes they maybe they're playing a varsity sport. Maybe they're doing so many extracurricular activities that it's just in it's it's flowing over into their academics. Or it's a much harder major. Like if that you're too. Yes, yes. if you're getting a two point six in nuclear engineering, you know, and they that's see one that thing. they see if you're if you're in history or and and you're and you're just not performing at the what the standard would be. I guess you yeah. could say. They're going to see that. So they want, you know, you got to have a good work ethic. Um, so GPA, uh, uh, this is all things you put on your resume, by the way. So your GPA, um, leadership experiences, if you have those, we understand a lot of candidates, men and women, don't have a lot of life experience after college. Maybe they have this one job, but then they realize I want to go SEAL. So that's all they have to put on their resume. But we also look for athletic uh, achievements, athletic background, extracurricular activities. You know, if you're the vice president of your fraternity or sorority, or if you're in public debate team, these are things that you would put on your resume that the board likes, the, the OCM and likes to see in their candidate selection. And of course, the most important thing is the PST, the, the physical screening test. Yep. Um, that's, these are the key things that get put in front of the down select panel we call it and they determine from these scores from this information who will be invited to so as in the summer and uh, real quickly applications are due every february at the end of february down select happens end of march candidates are notified in april and then they would attend so as that summer yeah as early as june uh, June. So yeah. currently we have three blocks of SOAS, June, July, and August. Uh, this is one of the big changes, which we'll get to in a, in a second. Um, it's a little bit longer. We changed, we put things in different, a little bit of different order. Uh, but this is to give a good orientation, a good idea of the candidates of what NSW is all about. Okay. And so after the training blocks are done in the summer, where the candidates have attended, then what does the timeline look like? So... An average candidate, they say they attend in June. They would have to wait till September is when the SOSP, the SEAL Officer Selection Panel, they determine who goes to BUDS. They're looking at the data cards that they receive from SOAS that our assessors jot down every score about each candidate and it gets submitted to the SOSP and they review it and determine who will go to BUDS. Now, the selection panel, um, are they looking at a hard card that has all the data on it performance wise minus identifying information so that they're Correct. basically doing a blind selection it is a of blind candidates. selection uh all they don't that know if is it's associated a male, female or by name or anything like that they don't right? know anything they just see the score how did this person perform uh it highlights the goods it highlights the bads and it highlights their overall score that they received at soas yeah, that's good. So they, they're they're basically selecting off merit. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then, so when and is when are the selections announced? So selection panel happens in sep early September. Usually October is when it's released. However, the Naval Academy they have a service selection night, which happens, I believe, in December. That's when candidates are notified from the Naval Academy. ROTCs I think is before Thanksgiving, so they're notified a little earlier. OCS is usually October when they're notified, and then of course the other accession sources being lateral transfers, inter-service transfers, Merchant Marine Academy. Right. Um, they're all notified probably around October, early November. Okay, so really like the last quarter of the year is when all the notifications go out. Yes. And then that being done, if a person is selected, 
when would they look at attending buds? Depending on your session source. So I'll just use OCS because most of the time, uh, most of the time, you know, the Naval Academy, you know, they've been doing this for so many years. They have a process in place. So everyone knows what the next step is and have an idea of when they would go to buds. ROTC, very similar. So NR, uh, OCS, they could attend as early as November. So they're notified in October. They could be attend OCS in Newport, Rhode Island in November. But what I tell them is sometime between November and May, right? Because May is when right before the next SOAS starts. And if there's any alternates, because sometimes the selection panel chooses alternates. Um, and these alternates don't get down if you're ever an alternate, because there's a high chance that you will still go to buds. It's just they could only support and allow a certain amount of candidates to attend buds. But these candidates, I mean, look at the attrition rate at buds. It's a lot of people are uh, dropping on requests, DORing or getting hurt, and they're having to, you know, not follow their dream anymore so that opens up spots for these alternates so there's hmm. always an there's a good chance that you'll get selected to go to buds even as an alternate so we're talking uh, about the following year for the most part right so say a candidate notified in november 12 weeks later they could be at buds as early as an ocs candidate as early as the summer the first stop would be naval special warfare orientation which is about seven eight weeks long um that includes what we used to know as buds prep so officers are attending that now but they combine the two mm -hmm. so that's where their first stop is before they class up with first phase it's, so that's, that's pretty much ending the timeline so then now they're in training and and whatever happens happens right. so let's talk about changes to uh so as specifically right so one of the big reasons i wanted to get on here with you scott was to just you know, let those aspiring candidates know the big changes that we're, we're uh, incorporating now in this in SOAS going forward. Um, in the past, SOAS was two weeks long, first week being assessment week where you would, you know, assessment week, very similar to BUDS first phase, but it is not first phase. We are not here to um, get you to quit. We're not here to, you know, make you, we're not here to make you quit. Our job is to assess you and see if you have what the community is looking for, and we document everything. So all that documentation gets crafted into a nice data card that gets presented to the SOSB, the selection panel, in September. So just so you know, that there are instructors at SOAS, but their role is to facilitate the training, make sure it's going, make sure it's being safe. Mm -hmm. We have assessors who are also active duty SEAL and SWIC personnel that are with, uh, as it stands, we usually get about six to seven candidates per assessor. So that assessor gets to know who they're assessing right in the beginning, and they try to stay with them throughout. So you get, um, a, you get to know your candidates really well as an assessor. So they stay with them and do um, assessment. So, so as... In the past was two weeks, like I said, and we have assessment week. The second week would be orientation to NSW and interviews. This is in the past how it was. So, so as two weeks long, assessment week, one week, then one week of interviews and orientation. Uh, orientation would include basically a peek behind the curtain of what are the SEAL teams? What is NSW? You get some briefings from senior officers within the community, from junior officers in the community, senior enlisted in the community, to get an idea of what the perspective is of incoming junior SEAL officers. And uh, now it's something different. Now, so we, do, we have candidates do course critiques at the end, and we're actually listening, we're, we're actually reading them. We're, you know, we're, we're taking what we've learned from these critiques and we're trying to incorporate it. And this has led us to how we are formatting SOAS. So like I said, in the past, it was two weeks. Now we've extended it to two and a half weeks. It's about 19 days. So it's, it's closer to three weeks. But instead of assessment week being that first week, that first week is orientation, strictly orientation. So candidates will be able to visit a SEAL team, be able to visit a boat team, be able to uh, have briefings from the Naval Special Warfare uh, Commodore, Naval, uh, the WARCOM com commander will 
give them a presentation. They will, so they're going to meet the most senior people within our community who will, you know, present to them Mm -hmm. and tell them about, you know, their roles and what's their expectations. They'll learn about mission planning. They'll learn about human performance. We have a, several courses that they'll run through a run clinic a swim clinic to better themselves all prior to assessment week so that first week orientation they're doing all this yeah why did they do that why did they flip the weeks so we wanted to we wanted to give the opportunity to candidates to see what nsw is all about before they actually get assessed and you know down deselect themselves or are not selected by the board they, we want them to have that experience before they try to try out for soas or try out for buds so i we we've came to, we came to that decision because it, it, it i think it it will motivate candidates to want to perform better like wow this is the community i want to get involved with now i know about the community let's get after it let's let's crush this assessment week because in the in the past versions the pst was pretty much like right off the bat they pst twice in a row and that that's pretty good shock so we got away from two in a row psts because we just felt it was unnecessary and Um, you've got you've got people flying in from all over jet lagged and the first thing you do is pstm twice so yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that's kind of a nice punch so in the pst face is to... now at the end of orientation week um it gives the candidates you know time to adapt to their new environment like you said the jet yeah. lag i mean we had candidates coming from france we yeah. have candidates in the past came from hong kong we have candidates coming from other places in europe canada um so yeah they this is a great opportunity for them to See the community, see the adjust community, to the surroundings. Uh, adjust to the surroundings you know. and get used to what, what they're getting themselves into yeah. prior to doing assessment. Fair enough. So the, the PST is towards the end of orientation week. Okay. So, what else? So upon completion of orientation and upon passing the PST, that's a big key thing. That is your first graded evolution, and you could potentially be sent home if you fail that PST. So... It's, it, it's, it's very important that if you truly want to become a SEAL officer or truly want to become a SEAL, it's important that you do well in the PST, that you do perfect form in all the categories, whether it's a combat side stroke for the 500-yard swim, it's perfect push-ups, chest to deck, well, chest to the fist, um, full extension, sit-ups, el- uh, elbows to the knees, making sure you're going all the way up and down, same with pull-ups, all the way up, full extension, and then no kipping. Running. No kipping, right? And yeah. it is important that, you know, we see candidates who submit scores and it's they submit like a, a 600 PST comp score. So that's like an eight minute swim, an 830 run, 120 push ups, 120 sit ups, yeah. 25 pull ups. We see these things and, you know, it, it, we, us, our staff realizes that they are the QA, the quality assurance is probably not there for these candidates yeah. when they show up to SOAS, that is not what they're doing well we've all the seen PST. it before the guy who kind of bounces on his on his push-ups yeah. kind of just half weighted down and yeah. up real fast and, he, and he's he's counting these as reps and the, those are not going to be counted no and you're going to have one-to-one ratio with an instructor assessor during the pst so if you're doing it incorrectly you're going to be notified of that and if you're notified more than twice you get the you, you it doesn't count. You're going to get you, that could cause automatic drop from the uh, SOAS. Yeah. So it's important that you're doing proper form. It's better to do 75 perfect push ups than 120 poor push ups. And the assessors see this. I mean, you're going to go home. And we don't want to see that. We want to make sure that the candidates are doing a good PST so that they can move on to assessment week, which follows the PST that following Monday. Right. So assessment week. What is what's changed in assessment week? Not much from what's in the past. I'm not going to tell you the secret sauce or tell you all the evolutions, but you can expect to be running on the sand with weight on your back. Um, you'll see some first phase evolutions, right? Whether it's log PT, boat PT, um, land portage. I mean, you're going to get exposed to all these things. And what's neat is orientation week. You get to try try these things out beforehand, so you know the first time you're not doing boats on heads is not during 
so as it's uh, during assessment week it's during orientation so we're, we're giving that opportunity for them to learn the pro learn all the techniques of everything before they do it so you're, you're going to you know do some swims you're going to do a lot of calisthenics at so as we're not our job is not to push you towards quitting our job is to assess you in the evolutions that we're presenting to you and see how you perform anyone who attends is going to see a lot of challenges and they're going to be graded on individual performance and performance as a member of a small team right and, and if you think about you know the seal or swick teams they're they are basically operating in small teams when they're doing missions this is a great example of seeing i mean you're not gonna be carrying a gun or anything but is an example of seeing how you interact people in a small group and how individually you perform your tasks yes whether you have the mental agility the physical resilience all that kind of stuff that's what we're looking leadership potential that's what you know going to so as means in the end these programmatic changes are a reflection of some of the uh, critiques that you've had from past candidates so you've reordered the things yes and now now everybody gets to a good hard look at the community uh, and yeah, what it's it gives all about. them increased awareness of on the NSW community and SEAL officer career opportunities. And then comes the fun week where you get to, uh, you know, team up with a, a small group and do a bunch of stuff and you're graded along the way. And what comes what comes after that week? Well, can I just touch on the grading yeah. um, without saying exactly what it is? We are the method we're looking at is we're looking at the character. We're looking at the physicality of a candidate, mm -hmm. the cognitive ability. So they'll take some psych testing. They'll do some problem solving scenarios, public speaking, um, as well as the big one leadership. So these are the four traits that we are assessing for every evolution. One, two, three, or all four of those traits will be assessed during that evolution. So mm -hmm. if it's log PT, you're going to be leadership physicality, you know, and maybe a little bit of character to see is this individual failing his boat crew or is this individual motivating his boat crew to do better right um so those are the points on gr grading but after assessment week um secures the candidates will have community interviews which is with a uh a seal officer and a seal enlisted so it's a two-person interview that uh sits down with the candidate and it is exactly what it is it's an interview we're not going to ask you questions about the community we just want to get to know you we want to get uh to see why you want to become a seal officer you know it's so take it like it's a job interview because that's exactly what it is so you do your interview and then you'll do your psychological interviews with our uh with our um certified psychologists here at naval special warfare you know it occurs to me someone might wonder why we go to all this trouble why why can't we just send an officer to buds like all the enlisted you know it's interesting you say that so as well the establishment of this prerequisite started in 2013 um you know i've been here since 2016 and it has grown it has morphed into something that is so useful for community members to utilize to see what caliber officer before they even go to butts so not to say that we're we're screening them prior to going to buds but we are giving the board patent the sauce p a good idea of the candidate that they get to choose to send to buds and if you look at i i mean the numbers itself the attrition rate has gone down so much since so has come like officers are getting through you know, I mean, obviously the Naval Academy, they been doing this for years. They have their own screener at the Naval Academy. Um, so they do well, the, the midshipmen at the Naval Academy. ROTC, uh, that's why we incorporated uh, the orientation weekends. Oh, and just for cross promotional purposes, refer to our last podcast where we talked about the Naval Academy screener. Thank you. Advertisement over. <laughs> The ROTC uh, historically have done have have been doing better since we incorporated the orientation weekends that we host here twice a year at NAB Coronado. They also get an opportunity um, to attend the, the Naval Academy screener if the, if the Naval Academy screener can support that. So we've seen ROTC candidates go to the SEAL screener at the Naval Academy. Granted, they're not they're not getting a uh, selected next to the 
Naval Academy midshipmen, but they are getting that opportunity to see what they're getting themselves into and getting to test themselves. Yeah. So ROTC's numbers have gradually climbed in, in success rate. OCS numbers, since we started doing um, these orientations, we invite OCS candidates to attend these as well, uh, as long as there's space, space available, but we allow them to come too. So these orientations, we jokingly call it SOAS ultralight. So it's, it's not so as you're not getting graded. This will not carry with you to your down select or your application, but it gives you an idea. Is this something I truly want to do? So it is a great opportunity for anyone aspiring to be a SEAL officer to attend these orientation weekends. And then also uh, something we've seen that helps the success rate. And, you know, as a SOAS program manager doing this for several years, uh, I host webinars and I send that link out to ROTC units. I have a SEAL email distro, which if anyone is interested in joining this email distribution, it, it, it gives me a, a touch point to reach out to aspiring candidates, provide information about these orientation weekends, about upcoming webinars. Um, I host about six of those a year, and it's just an opportunity for them to meet like-minded individuals who want to go SEAL officer, whether it's ROTC, lateral transfers, OCS, they all attend, and it gives them an opportunity, open forum, to ask questions about SOAS, ask questions about the community, and I could provide whatever, as much information that uh, that I, I know on the topics they discuss. Sometimes I bring in guest speakers to talk about the community. And um, it's, it, but the main purpose is for those candidates to get on an even playing field like the Naval Academy. Naval Academy, as a freshman, a plebe, you're, you, if you wanna go SEAL, you're working towards that. So you have something every day. These webinars, these orientations, allow candidates who aren't Naval Academy to, um, you know, n- get to know like-minded individuals, kind of build friendships before you get there. Do you see a lot of retreads? A lot of guys who didn't make it the first time, but apply and yes. come back a second yeah. time and make yeah. it? Uh, I mean, on average, we probably see mostly from the OCS because Naval Academy, if they don't get selected, they go and serve in, in another component in the Navy or right. Marine Corps. Same with ROTC. Yeah, because um, they're getting commission. They're period. getting commission no matter what. Yeah. OCS, if it doesn't work out, they can take a two-year um a two-year break to concentrate on the things that they did poorly or the things that they need to work on and then they come back stronger we i've seen uh, you know handfuls of candidates that showed up the first time didn't do well learned uh was told debriefed on what they didn't do well went home you know took a year took two years and fixed their weaknesses and came back and crushed it so, yeah. yes, we do have retreads. And, you know, sometimes it works out for them. Sometimes it doesn't. But when you come to SOAS, whether it's the first time or the third time, it's a, a refresh. It's not like that grades from your first SOAS will carry on to your third SOAS. So I, I think the guy we really need to speak to here for the most part is the OCS candidate, right? Because yeah. the ROTC guys kind of understand where they're going. The Naval Academy guys definitely are kind of told what's going to happen. They've got the most guidance and oversight because they're in a program. Yes. OCS guys are coming from left field. They're coming from the civilian sector. They've already got a four-year degree. That's behind them. They're saying, uh, I want to be a SEAL officer. And now I hear I got to go to this SOAS thing. So if they go to SOAS and for some reason they're not selected, they just go home. They're they're not yeah, committed. Yeah, there's no obligation to serve. Right. OCS candidates come to SOAS as civilians. Right. They're not, they haven't gone through OCS yet. It's if they get selected after SOAS, if they get selected for BUDS, then they are sent to OCS, Correct. right? To go through the, how, how long is OCS I think now? it's 12 weeks up yeah. in Newport, Rhode Island. 12 weeks. So you get selected out of SOAS. The next thing happens is you're, you get sent orders. You get to go to... OCS Newport, Rhode Island for 12 weeks. Then after that, you go to BUDS. Yes. Right. Okay. And so that's that's the process for an OCS candidate, just so everybody knows out there, if you're in civilian land and you're thinking about doing this, that that's going to be your path is, is going to officer candidate school, OCS. Yes. Right. Okay. Anything else you want to tell us about new SOAS program? Anything no, that pretty different? much wrapped it up. Like I said, just to highlight the key key points is so as is a little longer we flip-flop the weeks to allow candidates to 
orientate themselves with the NSW community, get some great briefings from senior officers within the community and senior enlisted, learn about the teams and what each team's responsible for. But I want to just put this out again. If anyone ever has questions, um, I'm not sure if my contact no, let, information let's, let's put your email out there again so my email if you if any candidate is interested in going seal officer my email address is andrew a-n-d-r-e-w dot dow d-o-w dot c-t-r at socom s-o-c-o-m dot mil and that's andrew dot dow dot c-t-r at socom dot mil and one l on mil one l on mil m-i-l <laughs> yes did i say two? Yeah. Oh, yeah now i just want to make it clear Okay. And um, that's the great, that's the fastest way to get in contact with me. I'll respond to your email. I'll send you the NSW candidate um, uh, card that we send to all aspiring candidates to fill out. And then I'll get you on our distro list. And then you can, you know, start getting involved with all the um, opportunities. Webinars. The webinars, the potentially the orientations. So. Scott, I just want to thank you for allowing me to come on here and um, sharing the the changes of SOAS. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been such a great time here supporting Naval Special Warfare. And um, yeah, so look forward to hearing from people. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, those are important updates to SOAS. We want to make clear to everyone that uh, if you've listened to our podcasts in the past about SOAS. A couple of those things may be outdated now. So this is the one uh, you want to get up to speed on uh, for the SOAS program. Thanks again, Andrew, for joining us today. Once again, I am Scott Williams, and I will see you on the next episode of The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday. There is nowhere to hide in Hell Week, gents. If you've been skating through bugs so far, you will not do so any longer. Get your butt down. Get off your knees.